before Young Dolph was a mainstay in the strip club as far as music and one of the stunny rap guys, and before he was bulletproof and getting shot at, I mean, he might have been getting shot at before back in the day, but, you know, obviously through this rap game, a lot of shit comes with it. And a lot of that shit that's happened to him has came from the label that he almost signed with, CMG Cocaine Music Group, Yo Gotti. That's actually where their beef stems from. They have one of the biggest beefs in the rap game, and it all stems from Young Dolph turning down Yo Gotti's multiple offers to sign to his label back in the day before Dolph even was on and it's because Dolph had too much pride Dolph felt like he could get it on his own and get the independent way and years later that proved to be right I'm totally with Dolph if you believe in yourself might as well do it yourself but this has caused a lot of problems for him in the rap game and I wonder if he knew what was ahead when he turned down that offer from Yo Gotti they're both from the same city I could see what Yo Gotti was trying to do he was trying to put somebody on from where he's from but Dolph was looking at it like you beef with 3-6 Mafia. Those are the kings of Memphis. That's who put our city on the map. I can't even trust you off of that. And another tactic Dolph said that Yo Gotti had was to talk down on his artists that he already had signed, questioning their work ethic and saying that he had to take care of them. And Dolph was the complete opposite. And that rubbed Dolph off the wrong way. So, you know, now they battle for the title of kings of Memphis. It's been bloodshed. A lot of slick talk in interviews, you know. Rumors of Dolph fucking Yo Gotti's baby mama, which Dolph took the Drake strategy with the diss song, playing it in the strip club, you know what I'm saying, the play with Yo Bitch, which was completely aimed at Yo Gotti and really disrespectful. It's never going to end after shit like that and when people are shooting at each other. Uh, we can only help but wonder what it would have been like if Dolph did sign with CMG. Memphis is one of those cities that seems very divided, and beasts like this is the reason why. Next artist we're going to talk about is Famous Dex. A mumble rap legend, one of this generation's favorite underground artists, man. This guy leapfrogged past all the Chirac drill rappers out of that scene by staying away from the drill scene. You know what I'm saying? He just had fun and had energy, but that style that he gravitated towards came from somewhere, and that's who he almost signed with. TSF, the Sauce Factory, and Sauce Walker. Famous Dex came out running with some of the most major ops of Chief Keith in Chicago, man. But they never boxed him into the beef because he was on a different wave, man. Famous Dex was always seen as a party guy and a fun guy from both sides. So in 2015, Dex decided to get serious with the rap shit and started dropping consistent weekly music videos. And he finally rung off with a song called Drip From My Walk. And everybody knew where Dex's influence was coming from because one, you could hear it in the music, but then two, Dex was paying homage any chance he got, whether it was tweeting it or shouting it out. Dex was a big fan of Sauce Walker, even at men that that was his favorite artist at the time. And so behind the scenes, they worked something out where Sauce Walker was going to get on the Drip From My Walk remix, and they also had talked about signing Dex to TSF. There's no clear understanding where things fell through, but from there, Dex goes out to Los Angeles and leaks out with Rich The Kid and signs with Rich The Kid's Rich Forever label and never looks back. Through time, yeah, there was a little animosity from both sides, but not really from Dex. It was always love from Dex, but Sauce Walker did come out the Holy Sauce mixtape, in which the artwork illustrated all the artists that were biting Sauce Walker's style or looking up to him, and Dex was one of the people that was on there. But since then, it doesn't seem like they have any beef and they've hashed everything up. And like I said before, it doesn't seem like Dex has ever sent a shot at Sauce Walker. He's only paid homage through the whole time he's been on. So we can only help but wonder what it would have been like if Famous Dex was signed to the Sauce Factory. It seems like it would have been a good fit and they would have made some pretty dope music. And the next person on our list is F-A-B-O-L-O-U-S, Fabulous, man. We're going to keep it short on this one, but this guy has maintained a lot of longevity in the game, man. He hasn't lost a step yet, but at some point during his career... You know, being found with DJ Clue and Desert Storm and rocking with him throughout his whole career, there was a time when Fabulous did think about going somewhere else. And it was with another fellow New York rapper. He might be like the only rapper that this guy didn't beef with, 50 Cent and G-Unit. It's not very clear where the origins of this deal came from or how serious the talks were, but it was serious enough for Fabulous to think about. This is when 50 Cent's coming out with his second album, I think, and he's signing Mob Deep and MOP and Mace, signing some classic New York acts. And one of the current New York acts he was thinking about signing was Fabulous, who was hot in the game and always coming out with a hit. It's no telling why this deal never happened, but we're pretty sure they would have some really good chemistry together and made some dope songs, especially some songs for the girls, because that's what they both do. But can you imagine Fabulous spelling his name out like F-A-B-O-L-O-U-S and then hitting him with the G-G-G-G-G-G unit? <laughs> That's crazy. Next artist up, Big Crit. This guy is our modern day Southern delight, man. This guy keeps alive all the Southern style and Southern soul that we grew up on, man. You can almost say Pimp C lives through him. UGK lives through him. 8 Ball MJG lives through him. 3 6 Mafia lives through him. Goody Mob lives through him. I can go on and on, but you know, you know Crit's style and his sound and his vibe that he brings to the game. And that same reason of production and making those beats that he has brought to the game. Almost got on a production deal, signed with Young Jeezy and CTE. Pretty much Crit was always making music, man. He was always rapping. 
But the thing is, he was trying to get a deal however he could get it because he was making the beats that he was rapping on. So he would have taken a deal however he could get it. And there was talks of him signing with Young Jeezy, Corporate Thug, Entertainment Label. And the thing is, that Jeezy really wanted to sign him. This is way before Young Jeezy signs YG and they turn up with um, My Crazy Life and My Nigga and all that shit. This is around the time when Young Jeezy signed Freddie Gibbs and shit. Pretty much Young Jeezy came across Crit and was like, this nigga's gonna be my Kanye. For all we know, the deal didn't happen, but we do know Big Crit did make some beats and produce some music for Young Jeezy. Um, you know, maybe that was like a test of their chemistry and it just didn't work out. We'll never know. But can you imagine that Big Crit being the Southern Kanye and Jeezy being like Jay-Z and Rockefeller, like Big Crit's like his just blaze, you know what I'm saying? It's crazy, man. But this deal almost happened, man. The next artist on our list is 2 Chains. He was originally called Titty Boy when he was part of the group Player Circle signed to Disturbing the Peace with Ludacris. It was a fucked up label deal that 2 Chainz eventually had to buy himself out of the contract for $100,000, which ensued like a mild beef between him and Ludacris. But after that, he was a free agent. And one of the artists that almost thought about signing him was one of the artists that helped him get his biggest hit at that time, Duffel Bag Boy. He almost signed with Lil Wayne and Young Money. So this is around the time when 2 Chainz is killing the mixtape scene, dropping heat after heat after heat. He's still going by Titty Boy, but he's shouting out 2 Chainz on all of his tracks. But he has every record label one in him, so he knows he's on the verge of greatness. But he always maintained a friendship with the guy that he made the biggest hit of his career with, Duffel Bag Boy with Lil Wayne. They always had a good friendship. They always had good chemistry. It always seemed like a dream situation for 2 Chainz because he already felt like he was part of Young Money the way he was always around Lil Wayne. But it never happens because 2 Chainz ends up signing with Def Jam for big money and comes out based on a true story and has one hell of a run in the rap game. And it's cool because they're still friends and they end up coming out with a joint project called Collie Grove later on and they're still friends to this day and still make music to this day. I think it all worked out for 2 Chainz though because he had one of the most epic runs in hip-hop history, man. It just seemed like that time, everything he dropped was hot or whatever he was on was the hottest shit. You know, he had No Lie, he had I'm Different, he had Mercy. He just couldn't go wrong back then and we never know if he would have been able to drop any of that if he was in the shadow of Lil Wayne or signed to Lil Wayne, you know? Next on our list is DMX, Darkman X, King of the Rough Riders, Tommy from Belly. All those stigmas are the same reason why the person that wanted to sign him never gave him the deal. Believe it or not, DMX almost got signed by Diddy and Bad Boy. Story has it, Diddy always had his ear in the streets. And somehow, someway, found his way around Yonkers, New York, looking at a couple different talents. One was the locks led by Jadakiss, Styles P, and Sheik Looch, and the other was DMX. And he decided to go with the locks because he felt like he could work with them easier and do more of what Diddy does with them, let alone he felt like DMX, he simply said it, quote unquote, his voice was too rough. And that was the reason why Diddy never signed DMX to Bad Boy. Obviously, it was no love lost. DMX moves on with Rough Riders, become one of hip hop's most iconic figures, makes some of the biggest street hits ever, gives us Eve, and gives us Swiss beats. I mean, I think it worked out for DMX. And it worked out for Diddy because Diddy's going to be Diddy and Bad Boy's going to be Bad Boy. But I can't see DMX on Bad Boy. Shiny suits and pop samples? I don't know about that for the dark man. Next on our list, French Montana. A guy that's been shot in the head. A guy that got his start in music from battle rapping on the block. Also being the DVD guy to the rap scene with his Cocaine City DVD shit. After he works his way through the mixtape circuit, especially with his homie Max B. Free Max B. Free the wave. He signed a fucked up deal with Akon. I mean, it wasn't really that fucked up, but it wasn't the deal that he wanted and it didn't work out the way he wanted it to. So as soon as he got out of that deal, he was a free agent again. And this is around the time when he's about to crack off with Pop That and all that shit. And before French Montana decides to sign with Bad Boy and Diddy, he had a chance to sign with Kanye West and Good Music, getting out our dreams. It's a simple reason why French Montana said he did not sign with Good Music. He said he couldn't get in contact with Kanye. He said that he couldn't get his phone number. He said the only way that you could reach out to Kanye was through email, and he didn't have time for that. He needed somebody that was more hands-on and somebody he could trust with his future. And it's still love. Obviously, they've came out with music since, and, you know, maybe Kanye had something to do with, you know, French being able to lay up with Chloe for a little bit. But that was the reason why he didn't end up signing with good music. And then he ends up signing with, obviously, Bad Boy and Diddy. Seeing that they're both party animals, I think Diddy and French Montana have good chemistry, and that all worked out pretty well. But something tells me that Kanye and French Montana could have made some epic sounding music together, man. For real, I think Kanye's sound really fits with French Montana's sound in a way. But at the same time, can you imagine the Coke boys sign of getting out our dreams? Really? Cocaine dreams. I can see it now. Next artist on the list is the D-O-double-G, Snoop Dogg. Not many rappers have seen everything that Snoop Dogg done seen in the rap game, man. This guy done seen it all. And especially when it comes to labels, you know what I'm saying? He kind of pioneered that whole wave of being able to switch labels and go somewhere else and still have the same success. Examples, Death Row, To No Limit. 
capital priority. Uh, Star Trek with Pharrell, Geffen. You know, everywhere Snoop's went, he's had success. But there's one place he didn't go, but I think he definitely still would have succeeded. And that was with G-Unit. All right, so if we go back to 50 Cent's first album, Get Rich or Die Trying, which had plenty of hits. One of them was P.I.M.P. Remix featuring who? Snoop Dogg. And they did the icy video to it. Well, around that time, they expressed some business interest with each other about, you know, working on a partnership. Not a just like a full, hey, I'm going to sign you to my label. It was just like, hey, this makes sense. We're G-Unit. You're the D-O-double-G. You ushered in the G shit. And then you add in a Dr. Dre relationship between both of them. That's kind of common ground. Well, you know, it sounded good, but it never ended up happening. But it's all good. 50 Cent ended up doing very well for himself. And then at that, Snoop Dogg within the next year has one of his biggest hits ever with Drop It Like It's Hot and then linking up with Pharrell and signing the Star Trek. So some things are just not meant to be. But it sounded good, huh? Next artist, Meek Mill. Yep, the Philly hometown kid. The original Dream Chaser. Before he was MMG and rocking with Rick Ross, Meek Mill had a deal in place with another one of the rap game's biggest stars at the time. Yep, Meek Mill had a deal with Grand Hustle. Yep, T.I. got to Meek Mill way before Rick Ross, like years ahead. You can actually go back and watch T.I.'s What's Up, What's Happening video, and you'll see the cameo of Meek Mill with the braids and everything. And the reason why the deal fell through as well, because T.I. caught all his gun charges, and you know what I'm saying? Meek was left in limbo, so I was like, what am I to do? So he just went right back to the mixtape scene in the streets and just rapping and rapping. He was lucky enough to earn the attention of Rick Ross, and Rick Ross pretty much signed him on the spot. And shout out to T.I. because T.I. let him out of the paperwork of the deal they had in line, and that was a real nigga thing of him. And from there, Meek Mill is the cornerstone to the MMG brand that Rick Ross built. And if you ask me, I think he was a better fit on MMG. I think that Rick Ross's cinematic feel fits Meek's music and his voice way more than maybe some of the beat choices and the songs that he would have probably ended up doing with T.I. And at that, Rick Ross really solidified himself on the East Coast by signing Meek. He got a lot of respect for that. Oh, and we just want to say from Sperry Springer, free Meek Mill. And the next artist we have on the list is Nas. During this time in the early 2000s, whoa, man, rap was so clicky, bro. It was crazy. It was all about your label or all about the niggas that you was running with. And so when you add one of the greatest lyricists ever who's involved in one of the biggest beefs in rap history, along with the label that's involved with another one of the biggest beefs in rap history, oh, man, you're adding fuel to the fire. Yep, Nas really almost signed with Murder, Inc. Things went as far as Nas doing features and cameos. Matter of fact, he was on the Murder, Inc. compilation album, but there was never no paperwork done. That's the crazy part. And the president and founder of Murder, Inc., Irv Gotti, he always says that this hindered his relationship with Jay-Z, and Jay-Z never looked at him the same because they had that beef going on, and it just didn't make sense that someone that he was friends with, that he produced a lot of music with, would go and sign his enemy at the time. Looking at it in retro perspective now, it still doesn't make sense. It didn't make sense to me then. You know what I'm saying? Nas and Ja Rule, that's not really Katie and Steph compared to Jay-Z being LeBron. You're not guaranteed to beat him in the finals. And then at that, the murdering style of just, you know, poppy R&B love ballads doesn't really fit with Nas as just, you know, straight lyricism. You know what I'm saying? And this actually did make 50 Cent beef with Nas just because he saw him associated with his enemy. Overall, I'm glad Nas didn't do this, and I think it was way better for rap that he didn't, because it could have gotten really ugly, let alone the move just didn't make sense at all to me. Yeah, next on our list is Jay-Z, man. Before he was the big boss on Rockefeller Records and, you know what I'm saying, the entrepreneur and mogul that he is today, there's a point in the 90s where something almost happened that could have probably changed rap. But uh, at a point, Jay-Z, before it was Rockefeller Records, man, he could have been signed to Loud Records. So the story goes, you know, before Jay-Z drops his first album, Reasonable Doubt, you know what I'm saying? He's shopping around the record labels, you know, trying to get signed. Well, you know, he's just a hot artist, so a lot of labels was trying to sign him. And one of them was one of the hottest labels in the game at the time in the 90s. It's called Loud Records. It's the same label that gave you Wu-Tang Clan, 3-6 Mafia, Big Pun, Mob Deep, a lot of classics. Shout out to Steve Rifkin. But he wanted to sign Jay-Z before Reasonable Doubt. They said he had too much clout and was running the game too much, and they would not let it happen. And that's why Jay-Z never signed with the Loud Records, man. But could you have imagined, like, Jay-Z, Wu-Tang Clan, Mob Deep, all that shit being together? Man, Jay-Z probably never even disses Mob Deep later on and, and shit like that, you know, on the takeover. But anyways, also, he almost signed Eminem, too, at the same exact time, years before Eminem signed with Interscope. So can you imagine that Eminem, Jay-Z, both signed in the same year with Loud Records? Didn't happen, but it could have. Obviously, Jay-Z, you know, he's well off. And Loud Records ended up being a legendary label of the 90s. So next on our list is one of the queens of rap, Nicki Minaj. Before she was young money, cash money, and one of the undisputed females in rap, she really worked hard, man. And her come up is very documented. You can search up on YouTube and see all the DVDs, the freestyles, the music videos. But she had a few situations, you know, before young money and cash money. And one of the situations that she had... 
really could have changed the landscape of rap and a lot of things would have never been the same. This really would have altered a lot, man. You know, a lot of pieces would have never fell in place if this happened. But at a point, Nicki Minaj was pretty much about to be signed to Brick Squad. So Nicki Minaj was on the come up, no, legitimately on the come up DVDs, freestyling, busting her ass, bro. She really worked hard to get to where she is today. But, you know, back then she had a lot of situations in front of her. She was just trying to find herself in the game. And she ends up finding her way down to Atlanta, and she's linked up with Dev Antony. That's uh, Waka Flocka's mom. I don't know if it was exactly her manager or what, but pretty much she was, you know, helping her out in the game, move around, especially get linked in in Atlanta. And she introduced her to Gucci Man, and pretty much Gucci Man was going to make her the first lady of Brick Squad. And the word is that Nicki Minaj didn't even know who Gucci Man was until she met him low-key. But the deal never happens. But if you remember, Lil Wayne kicked the freestyle saying, and I just signed a chick named Nicki Minaj. Yeah, man, it's pretty much Lil Wayne came swooped in at the right time, and that was all she wrote. The two continued to make music together, and Lil Wayne put her in the forefront of his whole Young Money movement, and the rest was history. But, you know, later on down the road, this did cause some conflict when Gucci Man had his Twitter rants. He kind of exposed Nicki Minaj, trying to say that he, him and Waka Flocka allegedly smashed Nicki Minaj. I don't know if it happened. We'll never know, because a lot of the shit Gucci Man said in that rant was crazy, and it's a new Gucci there is no beef because the two did collaborate on music this past year, which Nicki Minaj sent the shots to Remy that ended up leading to Sheether. So uh, I don't know, man. This is crazy. Nicki Minaj on Brick Squad. What do you think about that one? Next on our list is an icon, Tupac, a legendary artist, man. One of the most legendary. We're not just going to box him into being a rapper. This guy is an iconic figure that did a lot for life and changed life and his ways and his spirit still live today. With generations that never even got to live and witness him back then in the 90s. Well, you know, a lot of people say his loyalty might have, you know, led him to his death. You know, being linked in with Death Row and Suge Knight. You know, there's a lot of rumors about that. But who knows, if he signs with this label that he was rumored to sign with, Tupac might not be dead today. We'll never know, huh? But he almost signed with Master P and No Limit. So this one's really all rumors, but it's coming from a good source, Master P himself. Master P said that he was really courting Tupac to come down to No Limit Records with him down south. You know, in the 90s, No Limit ran shit. You know what I'm saying? They might have been the most successful down south record label at that time until Cash Money had their run. Um, and this all kind of makes sense when you think about it because where did Snoop Dogg end up going after Death Row? But don't get it twisted. Snoop Dogg went to No Limit Records after Tupac died. But I'm just saying it makes sense that Master P probably already maintained a relationship with the artist, you know, before. And so that makes this rumor sound like it could have really happened. I'm just saying that... Master P at one point was based out of California. He went to school in California, Northern California. That's where Tupac claimed he's from, you know what I'm saying, and grew up at a point. So they had a you know good rapport, you know, as Tupac rose in the ranks of the rap game and stuff like that. And I guess, you know, a lot of people say Tupac was going to leave Death Row before he died, bro. And, you know, Suge Knight really wanted to keep him there. But, yeah, I'm not going to get all deep into Tupac's death. That's a whole nother story itself and a mystery that we'll seem to never know. But one thing you can know is Master P was serious about signing Tupac. And it could have possibly happened. And a year or two later, he might have signed Snoop Dogg. And next thing you know, he would have had his own new Southern uh, super team with, you know, West Coast All-Stars. Uh, but it also would have brought a lot of beef into the game. Who knows what type of shit would have gone on between Death Row and No Limit. We're not going to get in all that. But that's the type of shit that this list makes your mind wonder about. I can't front, though. I could have heard Tupac on the Make Him Say Um beat. I could have heard that, but hey, that's just me. What do you think about that one, though? We go from one generation's icon to another generation's icon. An icon of his own, Cameron. Yeah, Killer Cam, before he's the boss of Diplomat Records, everybody knew Cameron ran with Rockefeller Records. He grew up with Dame Dash, and Jay-Z was a top New York rapper at the time, so it all kind of made sense. Before he signed to Jay-Z, years before, man, Cameron was almost signed to the top New York rapper at that time when he was alive. Biggie and Bad Boy Records. So the story goes, as told by Cameron, Jim Jones, and Mace, Cameron had a chance to rap for Biggie, and Biggie was so impressed that he wanted to sign Cameron. How did Cameron get this chance to rap for Biggie? Well, who was his tag team partner on Bad Boy Records at the time? Mace. Somebody that Cameron grew up with, went to school with, played high school basketball with, even participated in a state championship in high school basketball with together. This all happened when Biggie's gearing up for his second and final album, Life After Death. So he's really busy and never gets around to signing Cameron, but Cameron uses words to get his first deal anyway. He told entertainment owner Un Rivera, Hey, man, Biggie said he's going to sign me, man, so what's up? And that's pretty much how he gets his first deal. Everything happens for a reason, but shout out to Biggie for seeing the potential in Cameron years before everybody got to see who Cameron really was and the superstar that he is. But I don't know, him signing on Bad Boy could have probably gotten messy because if he didn't like the way business and things was being done at Rockefeller Records, who knows how he would have been with, you know, Diddy, you know what I'm saying? Because as we all know, Cameron's not afraid to beef with anybody, including his own boss, because he's his own boss. 
But I guess that's the type of nigga he is. A New York nigga. No, wait. A Harlem nigga, because that's what they be saying all the time. But I think he would have fit in pretty good with Bad Boy Records and the sound that they had back then with all the samples and stuff. I could have definitely heard Cameron on more money, more problems, bro. For sure. What do you think? So the next and final artist on our list is the best rapper alive, Lil Wayne. After it was Cash Money Records where dreams come true and all the dreams came true, Lil Wayne was a free agent. His contract was over Cash Money. He's been signed with them since he was 11 years old. Well... He shopped around just like Kobe Bryant did when Kobe was at the Lakers and he was a free agent just to see what it was like. And he almost got signed by his competition. Who knows? It might have been an ingenuine chess move. We'll never know. But life after cash money was looking like Lil Wayne was going to sign with Jay-Z, Rockefeller Records slash Def Jam. So really it's Def Jam where Jay-Z's the president signing artists like Rihanna, Neo, got his eye on talent like Rick Ross. Well, also at the time, Lil Wayne's the hottest rapper in the game, actually the best rapper alive, and his contract just happens to be up. And he wanted to spread his wings at the time and see if there's better opportunities elsewhere. So he did. And he linked up with Jay-Z at Jay-Z's 4040 Club, where Jay-Z and him chopped it up and talked business. And Jay-Z lowballed him and gave him an offer of $100-something thousand. And Lil Wayne verbatim said that he laughed that shit off and told him that each tooth in my grill costs $100,000. So the deal never happens. Who knows what Jay-Z's intentions were with this deal. So later on, through the years later, they just keep sneak dissing each other. But it's more friendly competition of like who's the best and just jabs. Don't get it twisted, though, because remember on the Carter 3, they linked up with President Carter, and they also performed at the Grammys, their Grammy-nominated song, Swagger Like Us, you know what I'm saying, him, T.I., and Kanye. So it's not really real beef, but who knows what type of collabs we could have gotten from Lil Wayne and Jay-Z. Shit, they might have came out there on Watch the Throne. You never know. Lil Wayne would have been signed under Jay-Z, so he would have probably been looking out for him like he would look out for any of his artists, and seeing that he actually kind of does respect what Lil Wayne does, they probably would have collabed and made some dope-ass music together. And now, you know, with Lil Wayne being an owner in title and the rumors that he wants to sign with Rock Nation, which he can't because of his paperwork and fucked-up deal with Birdman, which it kind of looks like Jay-Z's probably the better boss than Birdman. But family's family, so Lil Wayne stuck it out with cash money. Do you think he regrets that? Or do you think it just is what it is and everything played out for the best? So that's our list for rappers that might have signed with other labels. All these stories and rumors and facts really got me wondering, like, man, what would the game have been like if all these would have gone down? I guess we'll never know. But what I would like to know is what you guys think and your own opinion. So feel free to leave a comment. Hit the like. Make sure you're subscribed if you're not subscribed already. And if you got any list ideas, feel free to leave a comment, man. We'll check it out and we'll see if we can make something happen, man. It's Barry Springer. If the streets talk to it, we'll be here.